I must move now to questions to the Minister of Justice. I advise the House that questions 5, 9 uh, and 11 are withdrawn. Question 1, Mr Alex Maskey. Carmagalas, could I ask the Minister for question 1, in case I end it all? Um, as members will know, the Stormont House Agreement was an agreement between the Northern Ireland Executive and the British and Irish Governments. Since coming to office, I have been in discussion with my Executive colleagues and the United Kingdom Government to play my part in the delivery of, of the justice elements of that agreement. Political discussions continue between Executive parties and the Secretary of State to finalise the outstanding policy issues. One of the issues under discussion is a proposed appeals mechanism in respect of family reports. As this mechanism concerns material which would engage national security, the Secretary of State has been leading on its inclusion in a draft bill to establish the Stormont House Agreement institutions for dealing with the past. I understand the Secretary of State intends to consult before a bill is introduced into Parliament. This should provide a vehicle for wider discussion suitably informed by the draft bill. Uh, Mr Maskey. Michael Oscar Kola, could I thank the Minister for her response? Could I ask the Minister that would she envisage uh, such a provision to be made on a statutory basis for those families who might seek to appeal those uh, decisions? Minister. Um, I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. Um, again, um, when the Secretary of State moves to uh, publish his draft uh, bill uh, for consultation, there will be an opportun opportunity to put these views forward. Um, any appeals mechanism, I would imagine, would um, happen on a statutory footing. Thank you. I call Mike uh, Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister. I uh, should be aware that not all family members think the same way with regard to justice and truth recovery. How can she ensure that uh, family members who do not want uh, information uh, are not traumatised uh, by having that information forced upon them by siblings? Minister. I thank the, the member for his uh, question. Indeed, he, he raised a number of points um, concerning the difficulties with um, addressing uh, the legacy issues of the past. Um, indeed, when uh, we, we move towards setting up the Historical Investigations Unit, um, the, these are issues that definitely we need to consider. Um, and I would imagine the director of the, the HIU um, will take these uh, issues into to account when, uh, when deciding what cases to take forward. Thank you. I call Jonathan Bell. Uh, ask the Minister, does she agree with me that most objective reports, academic reports that I've read, suggest that some 90% uh, of all of the murder during what was called the Troubles was carried out by non-state actors, more uh, accurately termed terrorists? How can her department ensure that in an historical investigation, that we have the historical investigation on 90% of the terrorist murders, and not what seems to be the case, of only 10% investigation into those that involved any aspect of the state? Minister. I, th I thank the member for his answer, uh, or for his uh, supplementary, beg your pardon. Um, I, I think in terms of dealing with the legacy uh, deaths uh, during our um, troubled period, I think we, we, we do need to have a consistent approach in, on how we tackle that. Um, indeed, um, I would be keen to see the, the HIU move forward along with the, the legacy inquests. Um, a number of these are out, outstanding. Um, I believe the approach that we have to legacy inquests needs to put victims at the heart um, of, of our approach to this, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. So um, I, I would be keen to see this progress as, as soon as possible because that responsibility is, is still there. Um, it, it, in terms of legacy inquests, we, we will continue with the legacy inquests. But again, as I've reiterated in this House time and time again, whether we do that in five years or 25 years is, is a matter of trying to progress this as soon as possible and getting agreement on that. In terms of HIU, you know, that responsibility would fall to the PSNI and the other uh, justice agencies. And as a department, indeed as a Northern Ireland executive, we're not resourced to do that. So um, I, I believe that we need to find agreement on this as soon as possible. And indeed, I'm working with my executive colleagues along with the Secretary of State in the Northern Ireland office to see that if we can do that. Call Mr. Alex Adwood. Given that your department leads in the conversation with the NIO in respect of the HIU, can you confirm to the House that you have seen the draft legislation and that you are you or are you not making representations to London to ensure that all collusion cases can be investigated by the HIU rather than what was in the draft last year? when fewer rather than more cases would be investigated by the HIU. Are you personally making that representation? 
Minister. Um, I can confirm that I am working alongside the NIO in terms of trying to progress this as soon as possible. The, the Secretary of State um, has said publicly that he will move towards draft consultation phase, and indeed some of the issues that the members raise, um, I would imagine there is an opportunity to address that during this process. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Justice Minister for her timescale for the establishment of the Historical Investigations Unit? I thank the member for his question. I, I don't have a timescale for that until we can reach political agreement. Um, it, yes, as part of my remit, these are one of the institutions that fall under it. However, this uh, requires uh, the agreement of the, of the Northern Ireland Executive alongside uh, the, the Northern Ireland Office. But um, again, I maintain that I, I, I hope this will happen. Um, I'm confident that it will because I do think either way we are addressing these issues. And I think in, in order to, to address our past, we need to do it as soon as possible. <coughs> Thank you. Move on to the next question. I call Mr. Uh, McGuigan. Beg your pardon. Gary Melgut, uh, last can call you. Uh, Case de Verdot, question number two. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Northern Ireland Prison Service has a zero tolerance approach to all drugs misuse, both illicit and prescription, and alcohol, alcohol misuse in prisons. Hydebank Woods College's drug and alcohol policy outlines four key, uh, core tenets which have been designed to tackle the issues related to alcohol or drug misuse within the college. Number one, supply reduction, which are the steps taken to interfere with the supply of drugs coming into the college, which includes searching and the use of passive detection dogs, uh, the use of CCTV, drug testing, closed visits where intelligent or evidence suggests attempts to obtain illicit substances through visits, banning of visitors found trying to smuggle illicit, illicit substances into the college, training drug awareness sessions for students and joint initiatives with the PSNI. Number two, demand reduction, which is support services provided to men and women in Hyde Bank Wood by Start 360. Uh, number three, harm minimisation, which is comprehensive screening on committal by healthcare staff, detoxification, maintenance therapy, and referral to the clinical addictions team and Start 360. And number four, through care pre-release planning with Start 360 and referral to ADEPT 2. As a measure of the steps being taken to detect and deter the introduction of unauthorised articles into High Bank Wood, there are currently two women in High Bank Wood College sentenced to a period of custody custody for conveying a list A article in, into or out of a prison. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Mr McGuigan. Graham Elgott, uh, can I thank the Minister? Uh, can I just ask her, and following on from that, uh, that you know, given the availability of the drugs has led to bullying and victimisation, uh, can I ask her what uh, support is available for those who uh, in Ash House uh, su suffer from victimisation and bullying as a result of the availability of drugs? <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I suppose one of the challenges of drug and alcohol misuse within prisons is that uh, it almost becomes a currency, um, which leads to issues uh, as such as you have described, uh, where, where we've seen victimisation and bullying of uh, students within Hyde Bank. Would um, one of the initiatives that the Hyde Bank has, has uh, put forward is the challenging antisocial behaviour, um, and it's really the, the the opportunity there is to encourage um, uh, those being victimised to come forward to prison officers. It it's also um, enables prison officers themselves to be trained um, in, in this type of behaviour uh, with um, uh, prisoners to see if we can challenge this. But um, I suppose um, the difficulty with drugs and, and alcohol mis misuse within prison is that it, it's almost a microcosm of what's happening out in wider society and regrettably uh, drug and alcohol misuse is on the increase and um, how we stop that manifesting into the prison is it will remain, remain a challenge but I think we, we need to remain uh, vigilant in terms of dealing with this and the, the number of measures that I outlined above in, in my uh, uh, answer to, to your initial question is some of the ways it, that, that we intend on in doing this. But it's something that we need to keep on top of because um, it, it's, it's a case that prisoners will find other ways um, and it's something we are keeping a close eye on because we do recognise that the difficulties that it presents us. Thank you. I call Colin McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, rising from the prisoner ombudsman's reports into the deaths of Geoffrey Allison Patrick Kelly, Sean Lynch and Mr I, all of which have been published in recent months. Has the Minister, have you met with the prison, uh, Prisoner Ombudsman to discuss each of the recommendations and have you met with the Criminal Justice Inspector, Chief Inspector, following the report of the 27th of October? 
Minister. I, I thank the member for his question. Um, I have met with the Prisoner Ombudsman in the past, and indeed, um, prior to the reports being pub published, he does send me uh, a copy of those reports so that I can uh, issue for publication. Um, I'm meeting with the Criminal Justice Inspector tomorrow, actually. Um, indeed, we, we do discuss, uh, discuss a number of these issues. Um, I, just, I suppose I want to put on record, Mr Deputy Speaker, that these reports, you know, whilst highlighting some of the, the challenges that we do face within the prisons, I think are useful because they also put forward recommendations and in particular around the issue of uh, uh, substance misuse a number of recommendations were put forward in the most recent uh, criminal justice inspector report and um, it's something that alongside the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust we're working uh, towards seeing how we can implement some of those recommendations. Thank you. I call George Robinson. Deputy Speaker, does the Minister have any figure for the number of drug offences committed inside HMP McGilligan? Um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I wouldn't have those figures to hand, but I will say this um, just to reiterate my earlier point. Um, within prisons, it's almost a, a concentrated reflection of what's happening outside outside of prisons in relation to drug uh, and alcohol misuse. And um, I think it's something that we need to have a, a, a wider concept of and, and how drugs are actually finding their, their way into prison. And again, uh, in, in uh, response to um, uh, Mr McGuigan's um, initial question, we have a number, a number of measures in place, but it's something that we do need to look at. And we're, we currently are uh, reviewing our uh, drugs and alcohol misuse policy to see if there's any better ways that we can do to, to mitigate the, uh, this type of behaviour. Thank you. I call Roy Beggs. Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> recently the problem of violence and drugs has been highlighted in English prisons, and indeed there has been an announcement of some 2,500 uh, additional new officers. So, given the problem that does also exist in Northern Ireland, whether it's Hydewide, Hyde Bank, Wood, Secure College, or, or other prisons, are there any plans to employ additional prison officers? and to support, support those staff members that are there in the difficult task that they have to carry out. Minister. I thank the member for his question. In addition to looking um, at the number of officers that we have working within our prisons, I think we need to have a wider look at, in terms of the, the prison officers that are currently in position and see how we can perhaps strengthen their, their training around uh, this type of um, uh, activity that's happening within our prisons. But indeed, it's something that I'm quite keen to look at. Um, I'm keen to support prison officers in the role that they do, um, hopefully with, with the aim that they will be able to uh, mitigate this type of behaviour. Um, but it's something that you know, we're always mindful of. Um, we do look um, across the, uh, the water to see how um, other prisons operate in, in mainland uh, Great Britain. However, I think it needs to be noted that Northern Ireland is exceptional in the circumstances we work within and the difficult challenges that presents itself by, by being in Northern Ireland and, and the legacy of our past around that. But it's something that, um, as I said, moving forward, I'm keen to um, explore when we have the new uh, Director General in position. Thank you. Move on to the next question. I call Sean Lynch. Question three, Lady Hull. My officials in the Northern Ireland Prison Service work closely with the staff in the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust to facilitate appointments and treatments for students with mental health issues. Following the inspection, action plans have been compiled and work is due to begin shortly to implement the recommendations. Work will take place between the prison service and the trust to ensure that the health care recommendations are taken forward. The occupational health team at Hyde Bank Wood have developed new creative initiatives, including a student staff choir, health promotion days, and a sensory garden. Hyde Bank Wood is the first custodial setting in the United Kingdom to have a sensory garden, and the garden will be used to help those with mental health issues. Mr. Lynch, for a supplementary. Uh, last can call you. And Minister, I want to thank you for your answer. And answers to date. As somebody who was on the previous uh, Justice uh, Committee, I had visited the prisons on a number of occasions and, and saw prisoners with vulnerabilities, mental health issues. So, can I ask the Minister to outline what steps or departments taken to ensure there are sufficient uh, alternatives for these type of prisoners? Minister. I thank the, the member for his question. Um, indeed, um, through a number of responses that I've given around the issue of mental health uh, in prisons, um, the, the minister will be aware that I've been working with the health minister in, in respect of, of tackling this particular issue. Ultimately, mental health um, 
issues in prison are a matter for the uh, South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust. However, I am keen, as I said, to work with the Health Minister to see how, if we can find a way to move forward in respect of alternatives to custody. Um, currently, that those decisions would be taken by the South um, Eastern Health and, and Social Care Trust, but I think we do need to find a new way of moving forward. Indeed, on uh, a number of initiatives, I am keen to introduce um, an approach of problem-solving justice to perhaps, you know, at the point of uh, sentencing, look to see if there are more appropriate uh, uh, forms um, of, of sentencing um, around um, uh uh, offenders who, who do present with particular difficulties, and, and I have put on record before that I am keen to look at this in respect of mental health also. I call Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, is the Minister satisfied that she has sufficient funding resource in place to seriously address the issue of prisoners affected by poor mental health and wellbeing? Minister. I am not sure any Minister would admit to, to having a uh, you know, uh, an enough resource in terms of funding to address this particular issue. Um, I will have to work with the budget that I have been presented with. And in terms of mental health, I think there are other approaches that we could potentially take. You know, I have said on record time and time again that we need to um, perhaps strengthen the skill set of prison officers in terms of uh, how they identify mental health issues amongst uh, the, the people in their care and um, how we can. Uh, better facilitate um, uh, prisoners to, to develop them through, um, uh, through their time uh, in prison. So uh, I think there are a number of initiatives, uh, initiatives that we need to take. Um, I think it's heartening, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that mental health is something that we are uh, focusing on. You know, I, I've said again in this House before that I do believe that mental health is one of the lasting legacies of our troubles, and indeed we're, we are starting to see that, and in particular I see it within, uh, within my presence. Thank you. I call Lord Morrow. Minister had been said on numerous times in this House that mental health problems are very prevalent within our prisons. Uh, if that is the case, can you give any indication to the House today how prevalent it is and what you are doing in, to tackle this particular issue in the future? And do you believe there are many prisoners in prison, but they should not be there? Minister. <clears throat> Um, it is a significant uh, n number of our prison popula population do present uh, with, with mental health issues. Um, again, that, that it has been demonstrated. I, I do not have the exact figures to mind, but it is considerable. Um, and yes, I do think we need to, to look you know, at why we are putting uh, these people into institutions, because I am not quite sure that is the best place for them. Um, but however, in my uh, response to Mr Lynch, um, again, this is something that I will need to work alongside the Health Minister, because ultimately mental health, um, whether inside or outside of prison, is his responsibility of the Health Minister. But because it is such a significant uh, number um, of people within prisons, it is something I am keen to take forward. Um, you know, I have said time and time in the past that um, it is these issues that, that are encouraging people to offend, and ultimately you know, I want to ensure that that does not happen again. So we, we need to look at mental health provision within prisons, and perhaps even if they, if they should be finding themselves in that uh, environment. Thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I am very heartened by the tone of your answers to this particular question. And um, I would ask, have you had any conversations with the Probation Board around non-custodial sentences? Because I know they are very keen to see you go down this line as well. Minister. Uh, I thank the member for her uh, question. Indeed, I have had a number of key, uh, conversations with the Probation Board. Indeed, they will be a key stakeholder in terms of uh, helping pr uh, prisoners with mental health issues, particularly when they, when they come out of prison. Um, but I think one of my uh, difficulties around mental health is that we need to be taking a before, during and after uh, custody approach in terms of people that do present with these particular issues. Because if we can ideally get to a situation where we have stabilised any issues whilst they're in our care, I suppose the difficulty is, is that then when they come out of prison that that uh, support is maintained um, and hopefully then wouldn't, uh, would, would mean that they wouldn't uh, go towards um, uh, offending again. And that's indeed where the, the probation board come in, but also the, 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 the various health trust that the, the prisoners will go back to. Here's the next question. I call Doug Biddy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question four, please. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I am keen to reach an agreement at the earliest opportunity on a 2016 pay award for Northern Ireland Prison Service operational staff. Given his uh, role in respect of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Pay uh, Policy, I have been in contact with the Finance Minister on a number of occasions, uh, most recently at the end of last week. Um, at the request of the respected staff associations, some staff have received payments in respect of contractual entitlements due. That is one step progression for qualifying staff in their August 2016 pay. Whilst recognising public pay, uh, policy constraints, I, I must also have regard to the different environment and challenges prison grade all staff are working in and facing. Mr. Peter, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and as ever, I thank the minister for her um, her answer. Um, and of course, I knew the answer to that because um, I asked a question two weeks ago, and, and since then, uh, we've had prison officers remove. Uh, their labour for 90 minutes. We've had a death in custody. We've had an ombudsman report on another death in custody. Um, today we have prison officers balloting for industrial action. Ask the um, member to move uh, to the question. And a manning crisis. So therefore, can I ask the minister, can she assure this assembly that the Northern Ireland Prison Service and prison reform isn't in free fall due to poor management uh, and low morale? Minister. Um, I, I thank the, the member for his questions and his consistent uh, focus on this particular issue. Um, in terms of moving forward, I am keen to ensure that prison officers are supported in the work that they do. I have reiterated this time and time again in this House. Um, my negotiations uh, with the Finance Minister on how we can move forward on a pay policy, um, I hope, will be coming to a conclusion. We hopefully, will be, we will expect to, to hear news of that after we have had our negotiations with the uh, Prison Officers Association and the Prison Governors um, Association. Th there is work to be done in terms of uh, looking after our prison staff, and indeed, I, I hope to uh, announce a number of initiatives that I feel may may do that, but um, I want to assure the member that I do very much have um, uh, the prison officers and the work that they do um, at the heart of um, moving forward, and it's something that I'm keen to, to keep uh, uh, pressing on. Thank you. I call Edwin Put. Well, thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. The minister recognised that she took over um, a prison service where the staff had been denigrated and demoralised, and consequently there is an urgency about addressing this issue uh, to raise staff morale. Minister. Um, yes, indeed. Um, there is an urgency to address this issue, um, and, and I would suggest that I have been treating it as a matter of urgency. Um, and as I said, uh, my most recent conversations with the Finance Minister took uh, place at the end of last week, and I hope to see this come to a conclusion very soon. I call Jerry Mullen. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, do you support the principle of and the implementation of pay recovery for staff across your department and justice agencies? following years of austerity and pay restraint and for recovery to commence in this financial year? Minister. Um, I, I think we do need to be reminding that, that, that we um, still operate in challenging times, particularly in relation to budgets and um, uh, pu uh, public pay policy. And indeed, we, we, we need to uh, work within, within those uh, guidelines. But no, I, I think it's um, a valid point made. And indeed, um, I'm, I'm doing all I can to ensure that um, our uh, prison officers in particular are being supported, um, because the role that they uh, uh, do is, is, is a challenging one. And I think uh, to, you know, to enable them to move forward, it has to be just more than, you know, in terms of rises, there needs to be support as well. Training, development, it is something that I am keen to look at because I think everything else will follow from that. Um, and I think our prisoners will be better looked after um, in, in face of it. So it is it's it's an all-encompassing approach that I am taking and um, it will not happen overnight, regrettably, um, but it is something that I am working towards. Thank you. I call Mr David Ford. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Has the Minister been given any indication by the Minister of Finance that uh, prison service grades will be exempt from normal civil service pay policy this year? Minister. I thank, I thank the member for his question. Um, I met with the Finance Minister at the end of last week just to, just to reiterate. Um, whilst those negotiations are ongoing with the, with the various associations uh, linked to the prison service, it would be inappropriate for me to suggest what the outcome of that might be. But I am hopeful that, in terms of uh, the pay policy for prison service, we will have a conclusion very soon. Thank you. We move on. Uh, question 5 has been withdrawn. I call Emma Little Bengali. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Question number 6. Minister. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Organised Crime Task Force, which I chair, sets priorities to develop strategies and agreed actions to confront organised crime in Northern Ireland in all its guises. The Organised Crime Task Force undertakes regular threat assessments to identify knowing and emerging trends and threats, and it looks at how these may be tackled. Since the Fresh Start Agreement, we also have the Joint Agency Task Force, and unlike the Organised Crime Task Force, the new task force is operational. It is led jointly by senior officers from the uh, Police Service of Northern Ireland and on, on Garda Shikana, Revenue Commissioners and HM Revenues and Customs. A number of other organisations, including the National Crime Agency and the Irish Criminal Assets Bureau, are also involved in this operational activity. Its first months of operation have seen many operations targeting the initial priority areas of rural crime, child sexual exploitation, financial crime, illicit drugs, excise fraud and human trafficking, and these have led to a number of arrests with prosecutions being taken forward. There is a clear focus in the Fresh Start Agreement and the subsequent Executive Action Plan on tackling organised crime and criminality linked to paramilitary groups. And as part of the implementation of the action plan, the PSNI have set up a dedicated investigative capacity to focus specifically on these issues. In the action plan, we have made commitments to promote a stand against criminality and to promote a culture of lawfulness, including reporting such activity to the police. As part of our work to implement a fresh start, I will be also launching a public campaign before Christmas to raise awareness about the harm caused by organised crime and to encourage public to uh, support a lawful society and report information to the police. My department is also reviewing the legislative framework with a view to consulting on proposals for new organised crime offences in early 2017. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs. Pengelly. <laughs> The Minister and welcome progress in relation to this matter. Can the Minister clarify within the context that organised crime here is often allegedly linked to paramilitary organisations that the action plan under the Fresh Start commitment to tackle paramilitarism and uh, organised crime is undergoing a process of co-design and consultation as recommended by the panel report and can the Minister confirm that no plan has been rejected or money refused by Her Majesty's Government in relation to that? Minister. I uh, thank the member for her uh, questions, and I can confirm all three. Um, it, it is not the case that the Northern Ireland Office or the Secretary of State has refused money. Indeed, they sit on our programme uh, board and are working with us um, when we want to draw this money down. Um, we are not going to draw down money for the sake of optics, Mr Deputy Speaker. We're going to draw it down for the sake of using it in the most effective and efficient way. And indeed, that has been the process to date. So I suppose just to clear up the confusion around uh, the money that's been available for, uh, from Her Majesty. Treasury. We have not drawn down money at, um, um, from our perspective, and it has, it has not been a case that they have not given it to us. Thank you. I call Councillor Boylan. I'm asking for and thank you, Mr. Cabinet Speaker. Just following on, and I realise the Minister has given us her action plan, but she update the House on the discussion she's had with the Irish Minister of Justice in tackling cross border crime. Minister. Um, as the, the House will be aware, I have a formal uh, arrangement with uh, the Taunashta and Justice Minister Francis Fitzgerald in the form of the Intergovernmental Agreement. Um, we most recently met in September to discuss a number of initiatives, in particularly the, the Joint Agency Task Force and the work of the Organised Crime Task Force in respect of strategy and information sharing. Um, I will meet uh, with the, with the Taunashta again um, at the end of this month to, to uh, go over similar issues. Um, I find the, the meetings very useful because I do think we have shared interests interest in some of the, the, the issues that we both uh, face. Um, and I suppose as well it's, it's reflective of the, the new jo uh, joint agency task force um, that came out of the Fresh Start Agreement um, in that it was work that was almost happening anyway. However, this has put it onto a formal footing and indeed we've seen some successes from that. So there's a real pragmatic opportunity in terms of tackling types of organised crime because of the border arrangements. Um, and again, um, my meetings with the Taunashta, uh, Francis Fitzgerald, have been very, very positive in how we do this moving forward. Thank you. I call Daniel McCrossan. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Is it the case, Minister, that no fresh start monies will be allocated to the NCAA to tackle organised crime in this financial year? No, it's not Minister. the case. Um, the NCAA has not actually put a bid in for fresh start money since that money became available. Indeed, we would expect a bid from the NCA to, to be forthcoming. Um, so whenever that uh, happens, you know, as a department um, and the wider executive, we will consider that. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. If the Minister heard this morning's BBC interview by Kevin McGee with a UDA member, 
she will be no, she will be in no doubt as to the iron grip of these hideous organisations on the community. Does she accept that the executive's job of breaking that grip is made more difficult by pandering to those organisations and siphoning money so as to pay chief executives of other organisations to individuals who are actually key paramilitaries or community workers, that all of that compounds the supposed attempt to deal with these organisations? No, sir. I thank the member for his uh, question. Um, I do accept that um, tackling uh, paramilitaries within communities will be really difficult uh, for the grip that they have um, on people um, uh, w within uh, local communities. Um, and I suppose one of the challenges around this is, and I, and I spoke about this in, in my response to the, the, the paramilitary uh, debate in the Assembly uh, last week, it's paramilitarism versus criminality, and indeed, you know, from the testament that we heard this morning on the news, it does go to show how challenging this is. But I think we need to be quite honest on how we uh, how we approach this. And in terms of those people who want to move away from this type of crime, you know, I, I think um, we should enable them to do that. And these these people are a credit, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, it wouldn't be the case that. Um, we are letting you know, anyone you know, move forward on these initiatives. Um, but it's, it's something that I think we need to be really honest about you know, in terms of local communities. Um, but it is going to be challenging. It is going to be difficult. Um, and it's not something that will happen overnight. But I think in terms of the action plan that the, the executive has published and how we move forward in that, it will go some way in tackling this, particularly the criminality nature of, of, these, types of, uh, of these types of activity. Thank you. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Harold McKee. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The McGabbery Prison Officers Association met with the First Minister on the 10th of October to discuss a number of safety issues. Can I ask the Minister what her recommendations are following that meeting, given that the First Minister must have spoken to her about it? Minister. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. Um, indeed, um, I have had conversations with the First Minister about some of the, the challenges that are presenting themselves within my prisons and around uh, prison officers uh, and staff. Indeed, I am keen to tackle these particular issues. Um, um, get to the, the root cause of what the, what the case is. Um, indeed, we're working with um, uh, the various prison governors association who I met last week, and indeed I've met the prison officers association, uh, prison officers association a number of weeks ago to, to understand what the problems are so that we can uh, find a positive way of moving forward. Mr. McKee for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your answer this far. Last week saw the death of a prisoner and the Ombudsman report on the death of another last year. Can the Minister outline what she is doing to address this failure to keep prisoners safe in custody? Minister. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. Um, there have been a number of uh, these reports in terms of tragic incidents happening within the prisons. Um, it's something that I, I am very saddened by, um, and I do think that we need to take action moving forward. Um, in, in respect of the, the prisoner ombudsman's reports, he has outlined a number of recommendations that my uh, officials in the Northern Ireland Prison Service are, are working towards implementing, but also that the, the South Eastern uh, Health and Social Care Trust also has a role in terms of implementing that. Um, I think it's critical that uh, both agencies work together in, in terms of tackling these types of issues. But as I've outlined again, I think a lot of this you know, um, can be very much satisfied on, on how uh, prison officers themselves are uh, supported in, in looking after those people within uh, custody. Um, we've had a conversation uh, earlier in question time about uh, the mental health issues there, um, and a lot of these incidents seem to drive from that. So, I am very keen, as I said, to work with the Health Minister. Um, we you know, met together to, to affirm our commitment around this particular issue, but again, it has to be part of a wider holistic approach, um, and I think that as well includes um, how uh, prison officers are better supported in the, in the job that they do. Thank you. I call Mr Jerry Kelly. Does the Minister have an explanation for the very high levels of uh, sickness absence in her department, and uh, particularly in the prison department and the uh, youth justice? Minister. I uh, thank the, the member for his uh, question. In terms of sickness absence, yes, there, there are significant levels of sickness absence uh, within my department in particular. Um, I think it points to the really difficult job, particularly around the prison service and um, the nature of that job um, in terms of um, 
why perhaps officers are taking sickness absent. It's, it's a very stressful job, and, and, and indeed uh, a lot of the reasons why what we're finding uh, officers do go off on sickness is, is down to, to stress. But again, I think in terms of a modernisation programme that we're bringing forward for prison officers in particular, um, and otherwise on how we move forward, you know, I'm hopeful that we can address this particular issue. Other initiatives um, uh, that we've yet to firm up on the details, I hope as well, will address the particular issue of sickness. But again, I'm putting a keen focus on how I can better support my staff within my department, and um, hopefully we will see the, the, the positive outworkings of that. Thank you, Mr Kelly, for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for her answer up to now. Notwithstanding uh, what she said about the stress in the job, if it is a part of that job, I suppose the question is, uh, could she elaborate on the strategy that she has and does she have targets in terms of trying to bring down uh, the sickness absence? Minister. Um, it's at the very early stages in terms of what we are hoping to do, um, particularly with the modernisation programme. Um, the member will be aware we are in the process of recruiting with a new Director General, and I'd be keen to see uh, whether he you know, or to understand he or she's leadership in terms of how we take this forward, particularly from an operational perspective of uh, prison service staff. Um, but again, there are a number of initiatives that I said we, we, we've yet to firm up on details of, and um, hopefully we can move forward um, as soon as we can uh, decide what the best uh, strategy is. Thank you. I call on Steve Aiken. Uh, may I thank the Minister for her answers so far? And could I ask the Minister what is the establishment staffing figure, that is, how many prison grade staff there should be, not how many they are, for the Northern Ireland Prison Service, not including civilian support staff? Minister. Um, I don't have the exact figure to hand, but um, I, I do know there has been issues around um, uh, maintaining that particular figure, um, which in itself um, adds to the stress that prison officers themselves face um, uh, when, when we have those limitations. Um, I believe that we are curr currently operating um, in, in a safe environment, but it is something that we need to look at, and I think the, the impact of sickness levels um, um, can you know, have, have an effect on that particular figure, um, and we need to we need to find a way that we can we can mitigate that as much as possible, so that staff are operating in a safe environment, and the prisoners are being cared for uh, in, in in the most appropriate environment too. Mr. Aiken, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, the Minister, for those comments. Uh, within the Ministry of Defence, there is normally a continuous attitude survey that samples the views of key staff. Is there a continuous attitude survey amongst prison officer staff? And if so, as part of that, has there been any indication of how many are seeking early retirement? Minister. Um, not that I'm aware of, but I, I could be wrong on that information. If I have, I will come back and, and uh, correct my response to the member. Um, but indeed, I am keen to understand the issues that individual officers have in, in respect of their job. Um, you know, it's, to an extent, it's not the problems that are the problems, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's how we deal with that. Um, and I think as, if we can get as clear a picture as possible, then we can better support prison officers. And they are less likely to then have issues around stress uh, um, related to their work. And hopefully then um, it will mitigate the, uh, the opportunities of sickness aptness uh, within the service. Thank you. I call William Humphrey. Hey, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer so far. The Minister will be aware that anti-Semitism is the oldest form of racism. Given the appalling attacks in the Belfast Synagogue, the graffiti daub in the Belfast City Centre, the evil attack on the Jewish cemetery at the city centre and the email hate campaign against Rabbi Singer. Can the minister advise this House if her, her department can do more to eradicate the scourge of anti-Semitism in Northern Ireland? Minister. I thank the member uh, for his um, question. Indeed, hate crime is such a scourge on our society. Um, it's an area that is led on by the executive office, but in terms of the crime committed, it falls within the remit of my, of, of my department, operationally more for the PSNI. But I think um, as an executive, as an assembly, we, we need to be quite united in terms of the messages that we put out, um, that it, it's not acceptable for this type of behaviour. Um, and I think we, we can all um, contribute to that message by continually uh, condemning these this, this types of attack um, and supporting these people who are, who are very much rightly part of our community and, um, on, uh, and 
in ensuring that that message is out there, that this will not be uh, tolerated in any way. Um, indeed, the member will be aware that you know, the close relationships with the PSNI can also encourage this. The PCSPs um, have, have done a lot of um, uh, good work around this, um, particularly in North Belfast, where the, where the member uh, represents the No Hate Here campaign. Um, but again, we need to continue, continually press this message. And we need to be careful as well, I think, Mr Deputy Speaker, <coughs> of the language in this House and that we use that we don't infringe this type of behaviour. Um, but again, I think we all have our part to play in that. Thank you, Mr. Humphrey. Thank the member and the minister for her answer. Would the minister agree with me? It's not just in this house people need to be careful of their language, but in, in the media as well, and indeed those in local councils who put forward anti-Israel motions that have a knock-on effect of causing offence, annoyance, and distress to the Belfast small but growing Jewish community. I have already invited the chief constable to join with me in a visit to the synagogue. Can I ask the minister uh, to join with me in, in meeting with the Jewish community and the Jewish council at the Belfast synagogue at her earliest convenience? Minister. Um, yeah, I, I think everybody has a responsibility in terms of the language they use and the type of leadership that they want to take forward. Um, indeed, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to join the member on a, on a similar visit, um, particularly around the attacks on uh, the Jewish graveyard. We did make contact with the rabbi um, with the aim of, of doing such that, so I'm quite happy to, to uh, join uh, the, the member and the chief constable if that sends across a united message in terms of how we tackle uh, this, this type of hate crime. Thank you, Mr. Nelson McCausland. Not in his place. I call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, has her department or she ever received any complaint of wrongdoing or impropriety by Charter NI? Minister? Um, not that I'm aware of, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but I, I, I could probably confirm that, but no, I don't think so. Mr. Stalford. I'm grateful to the Minister for her answer. Does the Minister agree with me that it is entirely wrong for elected members in this chamber to malign good people who are involved in the work of trying to move their community forward because of the inappropriate comments of one individual? Minister. Um, yes, I do agree that there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of really good work happening within our communities, particularly around this 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 um, type of issue. So I do think we need to be careful not to undermine that good work moving forward and not to make problems worse, worse and manifest them into something that's not the case. Indeed, a lot of these um, uh, community organisations um, are best placed in terms of the communities that they work with. And um, indeed, I've seen some of that good work on the ground as well. And I, I think we need to be uh, supportive of that, the, the nature of that type of work. Thank you. I call Nicola Mallon. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, my question relates to one of the legacy cases within my constituency of North Belfast, and it's that of the McGurk's Bar Massacre. Um, can I ask uh, the Minister, is she aware of the evidence uncovered um, only by the efforts of relatives of the victims in a British Army ATO report, which confirms their long-standing view about the location of the bomb? And does she agree that this now warrants a fresh investigation by the police ombudsman? Minister. I uh, thank the, the member for her question. Indeed, uh, the member has approached me about talking about this particular issue. Um, as always, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am keen to listen to uh, the, the views of victims on this, and I think it will you know, better inform in terms of our legacy approach moving forward. Um, uh, the institutions that were agreed under the Stormont House uh, Agreement um, I believe essentially are to, to, to um, enable victims to get some sort of uh, to, for their issues to be addressed in terms of the, the legacy of the past. Um, I think what this reiterates is that we need to move forward as soon as possible. Indeed, anyone, um, I would encourage anyone um, who has uh, a role in, in terms of moving legacy forward that. Um, that we do so as soon as possible, because time is running out, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and I think um, the, the particular um, example that the member raised just demonstrates how difficult these particular issues are. And uh, we need to do this um, so that victims are no longer suffering. Supplementary. Uh, Mrs. Mallon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, um, can I thank the Minister for her answer and um, to ask if she may consider uh, at some stage meeting some of the relatives of the victims just to listen to their case? Um, as the member will appreciate, it's difficult for me to have comment on these types of issues, but um, since becoming Mr. I am, uh, Minister, I am keen to listen to the various uh, uh, victims represented on the various groups, so you know, I, I am happy to do that, yes. I call Mr Pat Sheehan. 
Norma, I've got uh, last one, Corla. Uh, can the Minister tell us whether an appropriate mental health care assessment was carried out upon the committal of Jared Mulligan to McGabry Prison? Norma, I've got. No, sir. Um, my understanding of that particular case is, is that it is still under investigation, and um, in, in terms of uh, that moving, uh, there, there's a number of processes put in place, uh, namely the SPAR uh, process, but um, I think it's an active investigation, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment, but if I'm incorrect, I will come back to the member with more details. Mr Sheehan, supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, is she content that uh, comprehensive mental health assessments and reviews are being carried out with all new inmates right across the prison system? I, I thank uh, the, the member for his question. No, I, I do think there's more work needs to be done. You know, over the past number of months, we've had a series um, of these very tragic incidents that have happened within uh, custody. Um, indeed, the recommendations that have come from the previous uh, prisoner ombudsman's reports would suggest that there is more that we can do, uh, not only within the Northern Ireland Prison Service, but the South Eastern Health and Social Care T uh, Trust has a role to play in this. But again, I think moving forward, it's a conversation that we will continue to have, but we need to take action on this. So I'm working with the Health Minister to see how we can best do this. I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Uh, following on from that question, is, is the Minister satisfied that the process of assessment is rigorous enough and that we can assure ourselves that there aren't people being committed to, to prison that shouldn't be committed to prison? Minister. Um, I believe there is more that we could do, um, because one death is one death too many, um, and I think we need to have um, a, a really honest criti critical assessment of how these processes take place so that we can ensure that we don't have another death in custody. So I do think there is more that we can do. Thank you. Quick supplementary, Mr McCartney. Has the Minister anything in mind, perhaps in the, uh, subsequent to this investigation, perhaps a review of the processes of committal? Minister. Um, I, I think more generally we need to have a review of mental health within our prisons and that perhaps be begins at the stage of committal but also during uh, their stay in prison and perhaps even before they get there um, in, in response to uh, an earlier um, question that I had talked about. But it is something I'm committed to doing. Again, ultimately mental health, um, whether in or out of prisons, is, is, the, is under the remit of the health minister, so she will be critical on how we move this forward. But again, it, it needs to be tackled. It comes up time and time again in this house, which I suppose is a good thing because it means we're now talking about it, but we need to tackle it. So I do, I do agree with that, yes. Order. That completes uh, question time. Can I ask members to take their ease while we make changes to the top table?